it is uh, the privilege of Antonella Denina and myself uh, to uh, open this conference. And I would like to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Jerry Pollock. Uh, I suppose that uh, many people know uh, who is this person. And I asked Jerry if I should describe his uh, kindergarten years and high school uh, achievements. He said, no, we shouldn't lose uh, so much time because you see the result. The result of kindergarten is here, at, uh, and he will present the lecture about the first uh, uh, phase of water, and I'm looking forward to, see, to hear about update what happened during the last couple of years with this fourth phase of water. You're welcome. Thank you, Vladimir, for your warm welcome. Well, so I, at first I, I decided to speak fully on updates. And then I realized that there are so many new people here who are perhaps not familiar with, with, with the background. And also, since there are other, other presentations that will deal with EZ water, I, I thought I would, um, I would start with a few of the basics and then interweave some of the newer developments. So, so some old, some new. And um, I, I, start with, I start with the inspiration that I received, and it came from this same Gilbert Ling. And Gilbert Ling was a controversial guy who came from China, selected among, among many candidates from China uh, to come to the US to study. He was in the first cohort. They chose three, uh, a biologist, a physicist, and a chemist. And Gilbert was the biologist, or was he the chemist? I'm not sure. These were three distinguished people, one of them, the physicist, going on to win a Nobel Prize in physics. And yet they all thought that Gilbert was the most clever of, of the three people. Clever but controversial. He came to challenge some of the um, widely held precepts in, in, in biology. Um, and in particular, he was interested in the water because he thought water was really important. And from his experiments, of which there were many, he came to the conclusion that, that the water inside the cell was structured or organized. Uh, that is, there are many surfaces inside the cell. And next to each one of the surfaces, the water molecules uh, took on a, a, a kind of order. And, and because essentially all of the water inside the cell was interfacial water, it turns out that essentially all the water inside the cell was structured. Well, he had a great influence on me, um, although we, we n never really were, were um, you might say, friends, but uh, a great influence. And one of the problems with Gilbert Ling's presentations is they're not easy to digest. Um, and many people who have looked at his books and tried to read them have had real difficulty. It, it, it was really clear he had something interesting and important to say. And I gave his books to some of my, my students, and every one of them said, this is really amazing stuff. He's on to something truly important. So I decided to take it upon myself to make his ideas known to, to the rest of the world because I thought they were important. And I did so in this, this book, which has a pretty cover. Uh, and the book, the book went on to go beyond Gilbert Ling. The book uh, suggested that not only is the water inside the cell structured or organized, but that the transition between structure, the dynamic transition between structured and unstructured water is a trigger for so many important biological events, ranging from the triggering of muscle contraction to the onset of mitosis to count, countless issues. So, so the book uh, turned out, despite the beautiful cover, to be controversial. Some people hated it and they said, oh, this is Gilbert Ling-based nonsense. And other people loved it. Um, um, but I have to say that among, among the more discerning of readers, it was very popular. <laughs> Uh, chosen from among all other books. Okay, so the central theme, the central theme of, of Gilbert's idea is, is shown here. Inside the cell we have many proteins and other macromolecules, and the surfaces of these proteins contain a lot of charge. 
And sitting next to water molecules, shown here as dipoles, that is um, uh, plus minus, these dipoles. And um, physical chemists will argue that because of these charges and because the water is a dipole, you may easily have one or two layers of ordered water. And Gilbert said, no, no, that's not true. You have many, many layers of ordered water extending way beyond the two or three, maybe dozens, if not hundreds, of molecular layers of water. And I'm going to show you later that, that the number of layers could extend way beyond even what Gilbert Ling had, had suggested. Well, one of the, we, we had real interest in pursuing this experimentally, even though I had been in the field of muscle contraction, and, but this seemed more important than, than muscles. It was so central to virtually everything. So we had a clue about finding a proper experimental uh, model. And the clue is that when the water molecules are ordered in, in some way, just like ice, when ice forms, as it forms, it excludes solutes. Otherwise, you don't have a pure crystal, you see. So we were looking for an experimental model which showed exclusion of solutes or particles and such. And by, by good fortune, we found one easily right away um, because of a chance meeting with a Japanese scientist. And so this, is, this is, shows what the model is. Inside a chamber, you see here, we put a gel. Uh, we started with polyvinyl alcohol. We put it into the chamber, and here's the boundary of the gel. And next to the gel, we poured some water and particles. And the particles are little spheres called microspheres. And what we immediately noticed looking in the microscope is that there was a region here where the micro microspheres were excluded. We kept seeing this again and again, thinking that maybe, at that point we had no evidence, maybe this was a region where the water molecules were ordered. So it seemed like a promising experimental model. Well, we found it so, so regularly that an Australian colleague suggested to us we should give it a name. We didn't know that someone else had published this in 1970, <laughs> some physiologists. But, and uh, he said, why don't you call it exclusion zone because it's easy to remember. It doesn't work in so well in Europe because it's EZ. <laughs> but for us dumb Americans, it's easy to, to remember. Um, so we noticed, though, that with time, this became more dramatic, um, that this thing seemed to grow over time. I'm showing you about five minutes worth. And the microspheres were progressively excluded. The zone grew. And here you can see a zone that's about 50 micrometers, which is really a, a large zone. So we were curious, naturally, to see whether we would see this zone um, in other materials. And one material that we came to use quite frequently is naphion. Naphion is uh, much like Teflon, it has the same backbone, but it contains charged sulfonate groups. So it comes um, in sheets. If you've got the money, you can buy a sheet. And of course, you want to conserve, so you cut out a little piece of the, of the sheet. And here you can see we cut it here into an arrowhead shape, plunk it down at the bottom of the chamber, pour in the water and the microspheres, and uh, this is what you see. Um, same as, as previous, except that the size of this can be up to a half a millimeter. You don't even need a microscope to see it. You can just look at it and see it. So, so this was turned out to be a convenient experimental specimen. So in terms of generality of this, uh, we found many kinds of material surfaces could generate this. Not everyone, but many of them, including gels. Every hydrogel we tested, there must be more than a dozen by now, show this. It's polymers, no hydrophobic uh, polymers would do this, but hydrophilic polymers, many of them uh, show this, not all. Uh, biological surfaces, everyone we examined shows this uh, exclusion zone next to it. And single, single layers, single molecular layers on gold, st standard preparation, when suitably functionalized, uh, show this uh, on a regular basis. So in terms of the surfaces that can generate this, it's, um, it's quite 
uh, uh, common. What's excluded? Um, we went down the range from big particles to small particles to big molecules to um, single-celled organisms, bacteria, uh, viruses, um, large molecules, proteins, and such, down to about 100 molecular weight and, and lower. So many hydrophilic surfaces generate these exclusion zones, and many solutes are excluded. We then began studying the physical characteristics. Um, you know, I've, I've alluded to the possibility that, that this zone may have to do with the ordering uh, of water, but I presented no evidence. So I'm going to list the evidence. Um, there are eight pieces of the evidence. By, by now there are more, but I don't want to bore you with this. And I'm just going to mention them because most of it is published, and anybody who who uh, wants to look at it, and, and it's mostly not, not new. We found the molecules were more constrained using nuclear magnetic resonance, that the molecules are more stable um, than ordinary water, and this was a surprise for us that the EZ has negative charge, and I'll go back to that one in a moment because this is really important. It absorbs light at 270 nanometers, um, it's more viscous, sort of like as, as viscous, it can be as viscous as honey. Uh, the molecules are aligned. The molecular structure is not like the molecular structure of ordinary water. And the refractive index is higher, uh, measured by two Russians, um, up to 11% is what they both found higher. So what about this negative charge? And how did we find that it has negative charge? Well. Here's a preparation that we, we used. Um, so this is a piece of naphion sitting here. And it's sitting next to water. And the water contains a pH-sensitive dye. So these dyes are like the dye, remember, litmus paper. You stick it in the water, it changes color. This is the same, same chemicals in soluble form. You can just put in water, and you can get, well, you can get these beautiful uh, rainbow patterns of, of color, which I'll get back to in a moment. So the first point, before I get to the negative charge, the first point is that you don't see any dye in here. This is clear in the exclusion zone next to the naphion. And so it suggests that whatever molecules make up this dye don't get into the exclusion zone. And usually these dyes consist of four or five different molecules, uh, molecular weight roughly on the order of 100 or so. They don't get in. So, what about the electrical potential? Well, to measure electrical potential, you need two electrodes, not one, to measure potential difference. So we use these electrodes that come to a fine tip, invented, parenthetically, by Gilbert Ling, for which he should have gotten a Nobel Prize, but he was too controversial to get a Nobel Prize. This was revolutionary because it allowed you to, to measure the electrical potential inside of a cell which couldn't be done before that. So they taper down to a micron or less in the tip. So we put one of them as a reference electrode somewhere out here, and the other one in the exclusion zone, and we found regularly negative charge in there, uh, electrical potential that could be as, as big as minus 200 millivolts or so. So it was a real surprise because we didn't expect this. We expected neutrality. When you think about it, what you're doing is you're taking some water, which is neutral, and pouring it into the chamber. How, so how can you start with something that's neutral and get a big region that has negative charge? It doesn't seem... So the only way that we could think that this was rational um, is if the water molecule itself was getting broken up. Uh, that is, the water molecule consists of H plus OH minus, and if somehow somehow the molecule would split, uh, then it's possible that the negative parts could somehow gather here to form the EZ, and then we'd expect positive parts out, out here. This is not, a, this is not a, a wildly irrational idea because some of you who know about photosynthesis in green plants know that the first step in the photosynthetic process is the breaking of water molecules into H plus and OH minus. 
So there's plenty of precedent for this idea. So we thought, if this is really happening, that the water molecules are breaking and the negatives are here, there must be some positives out here. And you've already seen the evidence for this because this dye, the orange-red color, means pH of three or less, which means that this is full of protons here. So because of that, we understood that um, the positives and negatives were being separated. And just to make sure that we were not deluding ourselves into thinking something that we liked, but that's not really true, parenthetically, you know, it's, it's said that only artists love their, love their models more than scientists. So we have to be uh, a bit careful. So we stuck an electrode in here, an electrode in here, with a resistor in between, and if there really is this separation of charge, then we expect current to flow from here to here. And here is one of the earliest records showing current versus time. You can see it starts at a high value, and it goes down to a plateau. But this plateau is not zero, so current keeps flowing for an appreciable amount of time, which gave us confidence that we were right, that there's a splitting of the water molecules, just like the first step of photosynthesis, between minus and plus. So we felt um, confirmed that really there was this kind of charge separation. So we have essentially a charged battery in water. So where are we so far? We have next to hydrophilic surfaces, we have uh, water molecules that are somehow lined up into a liquid crystal. Um, this region has typically has negative charge. It excludes solutes profoundly. And some of the evidence that I showed you hints that this dipole model might be wrong. Maybe some of you could already see it, but I'll get back to that in a moment, why this nice, simple model can't be correct. And, and this uh, ordering of water molecules may extend very far. So how far is very far? Well, if you do the arithmetic, if each molecular layer is about a third of a nanometer, then the size of the exclusion zone that we see means we're talking millions, up to millions of molecular layers. It was suggested um, more than 100 years ago that water has a fourth phase. Sir William Hardy was a distinguished um, uh, physical chemist, colloid chemist, and he said, Water, there are too many anomalies associated with water, things that you can't explain with the idea of uh, solid liquid vapor. There must be a fourth phase of water. So I'm not sure whether what we discovered is what he had in mind. It's a little bit too late to ask him. But, but uh, it may be, uh, and I just want to point out that the idea of another phase of water is not at all a radical idea. It's an old idea. So, what I've shown you is nothing new, except that we have some additional evidence. Um, now, why, uh, um, why am I suggesting that we're not dealing with dipoles? Well, it's actually very simple. Even I can understand it. Um, so, and the reason is that we measure negative charge in the EZ, uh, typically. A dipole is neutral. It's got plus, minus, so it has zero charge. So if you take dipoles and stack them from here to, to Pluto, you still never get negative charge. So we had to admit by this very simple reasoning that the model can't be right, even though it's so pretty. And the model we came up with, and I'm going to skip uh, for to save time, I'm going to skip the, the rationale for, for um, coming to this conclusion. Um, it looks like this. Uh, it's a hexagonal sheet-like structure. It starts with a material, a hydrophilic material, next to water. And from, uh, um, from this water, build one layer at a time, one, two, three, four layers that look like this, and they build one at a time. And if you look at the structure, um, the planar structure, it's a honeycomb structure, which we see so often in nature. And if you, and these are the oxygens and the hydrogens, and if you count in one unit cell, if you count the number of oxygens and the number of hydrogens, you find uh, 
that it's not H2O anymore. Um, it's actually H3O2. If you think about it, it can't be H2O because H2O is neutral. This region is negatively charged. So, um, and H3O2 is negatively charged because to achieve neutrality, you need H4O2. That would be double uh, this, and that would be neutral. So the easy is then uh, is a, a liquid crystalline structure. And a, a question that arises, since liquid crystalline structures can often form solids at room temperature, question arises, can the EZ form a solid at room temperature? This is a kind of water, and nobody expects water to be a solid at room temperature, but can it be solidified? So there's plenty of evidence or example. This is a sugar solution, and it was demonstrated that this is a liquid crystal. I think it was Louis Pasteur who, um, looking at the optical properties, demonstrated that this can be a liquid crystal. And if you wait long enough, out of this emerges a solid crystal, which actually rock candy tastes quite good. And perhaps you enjoyed that as a kid. It's basically a sugar crystal, a solid at room temperature. So a question that arises is, can you do the same thing with easy water? And the person who demonstrated that you can do that is sitting in our audience back there, uh, Vittorio Elia. And three or four years ago, he and his colleagues uh, um, demonstrated, um, and his wife, Elena, who did most of the hands-on work and sitting right next to him, demonstrated, uh, this is an absolute breakthrough in science as far as I'm concerned. And, um, and the way they did it is to take a, a sheet of naphion and put some water on the sheet, let an easy build, and use a roller to roll off the easy, and also inevitably it contained a little bit of ordinary water. And if they did this and repeated it enough times um, and put it in a beaker, they got something that looks like this, where this is presumably the free water. And, and this cloud-like structure is the EZ. The EZ is coming together to form a large, a large one. And I think it's no surprise and no coincidence that this looks just like the clouds that we see up there because I believe those clouds also contain a lot of EZ water. Anyway, to, to, to construct the solid, they put the water they collected into a lyophilizer, which draws, it's a common technique used by protein biochemists to draw off the free water, and what they found left is a solid, a solid at room temperature. Imagine solid water of some kind at room temperature. It's stunning. Uh, we repeated the experiment, and this is the result of one experiment. We didn't get too much of it, but you can see the solid easy water at room temperature. Uh, it's a kind of brownish gold. It, it feels like um, a, a strand or a thread of, of cotton wound loosely and, and such. And we, just to check to see if we really, if this really was easy water, if you remember along the list of evidences that I showed, is the absorption near 270 nanometers. And so we checked that. We put the, um, this solid easy into water, and indeed we found actually here it was 280 nanometers in absorption uh, at just the, the uh, wavelength that we expected, which we think is good evidence of the presence of EZ. So our experiments are just beginning, and we plan to do many more, but we're very happy to be able to confirm the experiments done by Vittorio Elia and colleagues. Um, the next question is, um, could easy water contain memory? Well, when we think of memory, we think of a thumb drive um, like this. And, and so the first question is, well, how does this store information? I think many of you know better than I do how it does. And typically inside, you have silicon atoms that are, are arrayed in a regular, not two-dimensional, um, lattice, but three dimensions, and each one can be addressed separately and through a rather complicated 
um, uh, mechanism, which I think is not really fully understood, the silicon can take on either of two states, which we assign a zero or a one. So each one of these has two possible states. Now, if you compare this standard computer memory with EZ, um, if you look at the structure, we have pretty much the same structure. If you look at the oxygens, which exist at each of these vertices, they're regularly arrayed in, in, um, in this, um, um, two, these two dimensions and also in the third dimension. So you have a lot of, a lot of oxygens sitting in a regular array. And the question is, is it possible that if you apply electromagnetic waves or subtle energies or whatever, that these, these energies could impact specific um, oxygen atoms to occupy one state or another? Now, what's really interesting is that oxygen has not two states, but actually five different states, um, um, five oxidation states. So it means either minus two is, is what we are familiar with, but also if you read any chemistry book, you have not only minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. It means, <coughs> it means that each one of these <coughs> has not two states, but five different states. And if you do the arithmetic, uh, it turns out that the the possible information density in one of this is, I forget the number, but something like 10 to the 8th or 10 to the 9th times the information storage capacity of an ordinary digital memory. So huge information storage capacity, and since we have this water inside our body, it means that our bodies should be capable of, uh, of storing enormous amounts of uh, information. And a question that arises, of course, is um, will information storage in easy water, particularly solid easy water, replace conventional information storage? Well, perhaps the most famous uh, person uh, who had been looking into um, information or subtle energy or intention um, storage is Musaro Emoto. Um, um, two of his whose followers you heard uh, this morning. Um, and, and typically what, what he was doing, the kinds of experiments he did, um, was to either play music, um, for example, Mozart to the water, and then freeze the water and obtain crystals. And uh, John Lennon and such, and either he would think of the word peace or thank you, and he could get beautiful crystals. On the other hand, um, if he said, I think this means you fool, <laughs> or heavy metal music, then he would get ugly crystals. And many scientists doubt this, but anyway, you can make your own judgment. And here, right after Fukushima, when the water was full of radioactivity, he came to bring his prayers and his in intention to water to clear it. And, and many people are now following from... Um, uh, Emoto Sensei, and two of them you heard uh, a moment ago. So, the answer to question number two is easy, physically distinct from the bulk. The answer is yes. I presented a list of evidence, and by now the list can be extended by uh, another half dozen pieces of evidence, including that you can solidify it at room temperature. And uh, at best, we understand it's a layered honeycomb structure with information storage capability. Okay, so um, question number three is what charges the water battery? I, I know that some of you know the answer, but some of you maybe don't. And we struggled for several years to figure out, you know, if you, if you start with chaos and you bring order from chaos, you need to supply energy to do that. It's a fundamental thermodynamic uh, principle. And it took us a few years to find out that, in fact, the energy comes from light. Um, we, we, uh, I, we simply couldn't imagine uh, that. But anyway, if you come back to, to plants, you know, plants get their energy from light, so it's not so astounding that it comes from light. And, and um, it was a student in the laboratory 
who did a chance experiment who led us to this. We didn't just invent it. He called me over to show me what he had. He took a lamp and he shined it on the chamber in which he was doing a, one of the standard experiments. This is a piece of naphion. Here is the exclusion zone and the microspheres. And where he showed me he, he's, where, the, where the lamp was shining, the exclusion zone had grown by quite a bit. And I suggested to him, take away the lamp. So he took away the lamp, and this thing began to collapse. It took tens of seconds to come back to the same. So it was fully reversible. And, you know, it didn't take a lot of imagination to conclude that, well, you know, if, where you're shining the light, it gets bigger. And so maybe light, or photons, energy is responsible for building the EZ. We did detailed studies of wavelengths ranging from UV to visible to infrared, and we found that, um, that um, the most effective wavelengths were in the infrared. But where does infrared come from? It's all over the place. If we were to turn off all the lights here and take out an infrared camera, that is, a sensor, that sensitive to infrared instead of visible light, um, we'd see everything. We'd be um, seeing uh, your, your baths, your clothing, uh, <laughs> beautifully. And so, of course, it's used as a uh, night light. Um, you can observe images in the dark, and it has military applications. So it's always there. You can't get rid of it. This energy that's useful for building the easy is always present. And so if you have a hydrophilic material uh, sitting next to water, the right hydrophilic material, you always will have some EZ. And if you add more infrared, then the EZ will grow bigger. Or if you take it away, it'll grow smaller back to its, uh, its original. So the answer to the fourth question about energy is EZ buildup is powered by light, um, which orders the water and charges the water battery. So it's a very, very simple operation. All you need to do is lie in the sun if you're, and your battery gets charged. And so, so the, you know, the, the way to um, uh, think about this is this water is receiving energy from the environment always. We don't think of it that way, but the evidence shows that this is the case. So now, if this is receiving energy from the environment, the next logical question, if you're awake and not jet-lagged, is, well, if this is receiving energy, maybe you can capture some of this energy. Now, my guess is that no, no one of you has, has ever seen a glass of water doing work. Or am I wrong? Okay, I, I think not. Well, I'm going to show you that it's possible for this water to actually uh, to do work. And, and it started with a disobedient student. We, we, we found out that Nafion, which we were using very often, comes in tubes. And so we purchased some tubes, and I asked the student to uh, put the tube in the water and see if he can find, with microspheres, and see if he could find a, an exclusion zone outside and inside. And within a couple of weeks, he had done that. But after that, he kept doing experiments, and one day he barged into my office, and I was sitting next to some, I think, important visitor. And he comes running in. Usually, this is a Chinese student, and usually the Chinese students are very polite. But he wasn't so polite. He came barging in, and he said to me, I found something that looks very interesting. And so, uh, okay, you know, what, what's interesting? So he said, you know, I see the water flowing through the tube, and it just keeps flowing through the tube uh, without, without stopping. And he, he said, uh, I thought this is really an interesting observation. And I thought, if it's correct, and it turned out he was correct, we checked it. If it's correct, then it, it means, um, it means that, that uh, there must be some energy. Because in order to push water through a tube, you need energy. Usually, it's pressure that drives it, but there's no pressure gradient here because this point is at the same height as this point. So I thought, if he's right, what this means is that the energy from the environment must be what's driving it because we couldn't think of any, anything else. So, so the experiment looks like this. You pick up the tube, you fill it with, um, with some water and microspheres, 
and you put it into a chamber that has water and microspheres, bring it to the microscope, use a little bit of light to minimize the light, and this is what you see. We had this going for as long as a day and a half without stopping. It just keeps going. Um, we wanted to try some material other than Nafion tubes because maybe this was some crazy feature of Nafion that we didn't understand. And so we created tunnels inside of gels by taking a wire and pulling the wire out, leaving a tunnel as it was gelling. Then we'd have a, a chunk of gel with a tunnel. We'd put it into water and microspheres. And this is what we saw. So this is a polyacrylic acid gel. And here's the tunnel. And next to the surface of the gel is EZ, EZ. And all the microspheres are here. And, um, and we got the same result with eight different gels. The velocity was different. And of course, we were curious to see what happens. We think this is driven by light. And so someone suggested, why don't you just add more light? And so we took up the suggestion, and we added more light, and we could increase the speed by five times just by uh, increasing the light. So, so we have a situation with a hollow tube. Work is done because water is flowing through. To do work, you need energy. Um, and so unless someone can think of some other kind of, of uh, energy uh, transduction mechanism, it looks like the energy absorption inside the water is a necessary condition. So basically the water transduces light energy into, into mechanical energy. This may seem a little surprising or weird, but remember, the same thing happens in plants. Light energy um, builds chemical potential in the plant and the plant then uses this energy for metabolism, for growth, for bending, for whatever. And the results I presented suggest that the same thing happens in water as happens in plants. And it's no surprise because the plant is mostly water. So it means that the water always contains energy. There should be a constant here, I'm sorry, otherwise the units don't match. But, but I think you, you see the essence is that this contains energy all the time. We don't think of it as such. So why is this important? Um, I think it could be foundational for any science involving water, molecules, and light, and foundational for health. So with the time I have left, um, uh, I, I'm going to talk a little about this. Uh, we, we receive, the question is, do we use light energy? So you all know that plants do it, and also some bacteria photosynthesize as well. So he asked the question, if you were Mother Nature and you were quite successful at, at plants, using energy for plants, um, and you decided one day, hey, you know, I think I'm going to invent animals. I'm getting a little tired of plants. Um, so you have, you have a couple of choices. One, one choice is to throw away this transduction mechanism using light and go for a new one. Uh, animals can forage, they can get food, they can, you can use the food to get the energy. So if you're Mother Nature, would you throw away what you got and use successfully? Or would you retain it uh, as a backup or as a supplement or whatever? I think being conservative, Mother Nature would probably keep this in reserve for us. We don't think that we use light, but I'd like to suggest to you that we use light, not exactly as plants do, but in, in, in kind of much the same way. We receive light all the time. And the first idea um, that we were thinking of was maybe the cardiovascular system because there are lots of blood vessels near the surface. Um, and the light penetrates, depending on wavelength, beneath the surface. So who knows, maybe nature is using light to help propel blood and the cardiovascular system. At first I thought um, this is very unlikely because um, I studied the pressure and flow in the cardiovascular system for my PhD. I thought we, we understood everything. And so when my good friend Vladimir invited me to Moscow University and introduced me to his next door neighbor, who came and said, there's a big problem in the cardiovascular system. I approached this with a little bit of arrogance and doubt, 
you know, I thought I, I really knew it all. Within five minutes, he had me convinced that there really was a big problem. So what's the big problem? The big problem is that the red blood cells are six or seven micrometers in diameter, and they have to pass through blood vessels that capillaries that in young, healthy adults can be three or four micrometers in diameter. That is half the diameter. So how does a, how does a big, galumphing red blood cell get through a narrow diameter? It looked, it looked as though nature uh, had made a mistake, because usually you don't do that. You don't take a football and try to squeeze it through a pipe that's, that's this big. Um, so it, it turns out, uh, indeed, that uh, this is the way it works. So red, red blood cells should look like this, but, but when they go through blood vessels, and you see some blood vessels here in muscle tissue, um, you can watch the video here. In order to get through, they... Uh, whoops. Is this supposed to work? They need to bend. So in order to bend, and you can see this guy is having some difficulty. In order to bend, you need to supply energy because you have to squeeze something. I, I always like to use the analogy. It's sort of like the toilet. Sometimes the toilet won't flush, you know, and you need to take the plunger and push it through, and this takes energy. Multiply that by a gazillion red blood cells, and you come to the conclusion that Vladimir's friends came to that if the heart were responsible for doing this, the heart would need to develop a pressure that's something like a million times the pressure that it actually develops. And these guys said, no way. So they had some other ideas, and I'm starting to think, you know, gee, we just found in the laboratory that we take a tube, and put it in water, and we can get spontaneous flow. Is it possible that the same mechanism is, is used in, in, here in nature? So we, we had this, and the question is, might radiant energy or light uh, help to drive blood flow. And um, so um, we, uh, we found support from an Israeli group that uh, just published a paper. They were studying mice. They were exploring, measuring blood flow in response to uh, some drugs or I, I can't remember what. And when the experiment was over, they did what, what experimenters usually do, they sacrifice the mouse. And the mouse died within 10 seconds. The heart stopped beating. But they found they were measuring the flow, and the flow didn't stop. So they were totally puzzled because, of course, when, you know, when you're dead and the heart stops beating, um, you shouldn't have any blood flow. But the, blood, the flow kept going. Reduced velocity, but it kept going. And they waited five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. Then they repeated the experiment in 10 mice. They got exactly the same results. And they concluded that they were bewildered because something is going on. And my resourceful student found similar results, a half dozen different papers published over the past century or so that came using different models that came to the same conclusion. But of course, these papers are all ignored because everybody knows that it can't happen, that the heart is solely responsible for driving blood flow. Therefore, it can't be true. So we did our own experiments, and the experiments are just completed. Um, so we uh, um, used a chick embryo three days old, and here you can see it. So this is the egg, and we lopped off the surface of the egg, took it off, and you can see the embryo, the vascular system in the embryo developing. And uh, um, Zhang Li was able to microscopically examine this, this vein here and another vein here. Um, and the first, first question was, if you stop the heart, does the flow continue? He stopped the heart just by dropping potassium chloride on it, and he found that the flow continued. So, so here's flow versus time. And you can see that the flow diminishes, but it doesn't go to zero. It goes to some plateau value, which actually continues. And then he wanted to test whether our model, the, the flow in the tube, is what was driving the flow. And the um, signature feature of this 
mechanism is that infrared energy is driving it. So if you add more infrared, it should speed up. So he applied infrared, and you can see that the speed increased by about three times. And then he removed the infrared, and it went back to the baseline. So we just submitted this uh, for publication. And uh, so we, we concluded, um, indeed, that radiant energy does help to drive uh, blood flow. And um, um, so it means that if we're right, it means that in your cardiovascular system, it means that it's not just the heart that's driving the flow, but also the blood vessels themselves are assisting the heart in driving the flow. We don't know how much is going on, but you know, and this has, this has important implications because it means therapeutically, for example, uh, it means, well, first of all, physiologically, that your metabolism, which is generating heat, the heat is not wasted. The heat is used to drive blood flow. And it means therapeutically that if you were to apply infrared energy from outside, it should help to increase your blood flow. So the question is, uh, what about elsewhere in the body? And I think the answer is yes. It's not just in the cardiovascular system. If you look at, for example, a typical cell, so the cell contains solids, mostly proteins, uh, some nucleic acids and others, and they interface with water, and so this should be easy water and negative charge, and the cell is very crowded, so it's got um, lots of easy water practically filling the cell, and lots of negative charge, the positive charge goes out, it's free, it's driven out, there are Re positive charges repel each other. So inside the cell, you've got negative charges that repel one another, and that repulsion is potential energy. And I've argued uh, in other places that this potential energy is what drives protein folding. Protein folding is what does the work of, of the cell. So, so the situation is something like this, that you have a protein in its extended state with easy water uh, surrounding it. And um, what happens is the easy water melts, transitions into ordinary water, and then simultaneously the protein folds. And then going back to the quiescent uh, resting situation, the easy water builds back up again. And the protein goes and occupies its extended form. Now, if you don't have easy water, you don't have enough of it, then the protein is impotent. It can't do its job anymore. So basically, potential energy from, from easy drives the work of the cell. So to go through the process, light builds easy. You get negative charge from that. You get energy, potential energy from that, and this energy is used for the work or folding of proteins, the work, work of the cell. Connecting the dots, light is responsible or partly responsible for work or folding of the proteins. So where do we get our energy? Well, um, of course, uh, particularly in, in, in Europe, I just came from Italy, um, we get our energy from food and the food is really delicious there. But also, we get energy from light. This is what we, we don't think about. The light is absorbed by the water, which builds EZ, which gives us energy. So should this matter to you? Yeah, well, water matters, of course we know that, and light matters. And so for your health, the question that you may wish to ask is, what builds easy water inside your cells? Because you need that easy water to function properly. And, and I'm going to give you a list of six of them. And these are very common expedients known for many years to be good for health. But nobody really has understood the mechanism. And I think the mechanism may be as simple as just build up of easy water. The first is drinking a lot of water or foods containing water, is the raw material for building easy water. So we all know we need to drink a lot. The next one is green juicing. So what's that? Well, you take freshly grown plants, you squeeze them. You're squeezing out the water from inside the cell. This is intracellular water. It's filled with EZ. So you're squeezing out the EZ, and you're drinking the EZ. And possibly, by drinking this EZ water, 
the easy water that you've been drinking is used to fill, to replace, to, to amplify areas where easy water is missing, where the cells are pathological or, or ill. Another is various substances that have been known even since Ayurvedic times to be good, generally good for your health. And we studied uh, seven or eight of these now, by now and just recently published it this year, last year. And we found that they expand, uh, they all expand the exclusion zone. So one example is basil or holy basil used. And this is easy size and this is concentration. And you can see what happens is that at the low concentrations, which would be common um, typical of what we have in the body, the easy water expands. At high concentrations, almost everything reduces the size of the easy. We did the same with coconut water and essentially there, we got the same result. We also studied fats. You know, fats have been cast in the past as villains. Shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't be using fats because they clog our arteries and the sense has reversed in the past uh, decade or so, fats are now considered to be good for health, stay away from sugars. So we wondered whether fats, whether EZs build ne next to fats. And here's what we found. This is ghee, cold ghee. You can see a sizable EZ. We've, si we've seen exclusion zones actually up to as much as one millimeter next to ghee. R very large ones. Coconut oil, coconut oil, the same. Lard and organic clarified butter. We also studied chia seed, um, thanks to uh, the influence of Gina Bria, who's sitting there. And this is a, this is a seed, and these seeds are, have been known for, for practically forever to be good for health. So this is a seed sitting here, um, and a, a, a droplet of water is placed around the seed, and we added a dye, uh, Evans Blue dye, which is known to be excluded from easy water. And so you can see the exclusion zone where the, you don't have any dye is actually close to a millimeter in size. So chia builds huge amounts of EZ. So back to, back to this, many of these expand or build EZ and we think that this could be the reason why they're so good for health. In Seattle we don't get much sunshine in the winter. It's dark, gray and gloomy. And, uh, we, uh, when you go out and, and the sun breaks through the clouds, everybody feels good. So why do you feel good? Well, um, the sun, 50% approximately of the sun's energy is infrared. Infrared energy hits you, you absorb the infrared, more easy water gets built. If you start depressed, your brain is not functioning optimally, you receive the light, you feel good. We don't know if this is the mechanism, but it follows directly from the line of reasoning. And the sauna is, of course, the ultimate. Uh, um, uh, your, the sauna is full of infrared energy. It's heat. Heat generates, um, it's equivalent to inf infrared energy. And so you sit in there for 20 minutes, you absorb uh, the, the infrared energy. And if everything I've told you is correct, it should build EZ all over your body. And most of us have had the experience. You go in, you feel exhausted, you've got muscle pains, whatever, you come out feeling good afterward. Possibly the mechanism is as I've suggested to you. And in terms of earthing, you connect yourself. We have Jim Osman here, who is maybe the world's expert on this sort of thing. Um, and if you connect yourself to the earth, connect yourself to the negative earth, you're actually connecting yourself uh, to an infinite, practically infinite supply of negative charge. We found that you add negative charge to water, gives you easy, builds easy. So possibly the reason why connecting yourself to the earth is so beneficial to health is you can draw in electrons which then help build easy water. So um, I, I will summarize here um, and say that um, there's a fourth phase of water. I presented the evidence to you, and it sits in between ice and water because the structure of the EZ is not so different from the structure of ice. It's not the same. And we have found that if you want to freeze water, um, you must go through the EZ phase in order to get to ice. And we found that if you melt ice, um, 
um, that you must go through the easy phase to get to water. And uh, that could be the reason why some cultures uh, tend to healthy, people who remain healthy and vibrant and well into their hundreds, um, often drink ice melt. We think this should contain a lot of easy water. Time. This is, I think, a central feature of what we've identified. It's not at equilibrium with the environment. It's constantly absorbing infrared and using this infrared to do things. And I've given you one example. So one of them is, is um, biological. I, I've shown you that in the cardiovascular system that this energy, uh, this contains lots of water, <laughs> this energy is used to drive blood flow in, in small vessels and also in other aspects of every cell in your body, this kind of energy is being used. And in terms of chemistry, uh, you know, the, the chemistry books uh, have gone through elaborate interpretations of many reactions that take place in water. If what I present to you is correct, it means that many of the interpretations will need to change because in the interpretations in the standard textbook don't take into account the separation of charge, the easy, the effect of light, et cetera, et cetera, which is seemingly central. We're obsessed with climate change. It seems that, it seems that in order to deal effectively with climate change, it's helpful to know about climate, uh, what causes. And when we speak of climate, we're basically talking about clouds because clouds represent weather. Scientists, um, atmospheric, one atmospheric science, scientist has whispered to me that the atmospheric scientists don't know two fundamental features. How do clouds form and what's responsible for evaporation? They really don't understand it, although there's a kind of pretense that they do. Until we understand it, it's going to be difficult um, to figure out what's going on. And I think a key feature that's missing in the current analysis of weather is charge. We know that clouds are charged. There's actually independent evidence from 50 or 60 years ago, but people have forgotten it. I think the charge comes from EZ. There's evidence for that. My next book will be, will be discussing it. This is completely absent from any considerations of clouds and how they work and how they form. So I think the reason why they give us a 50% probability it's going to rain or it's not going to rain, should we take an umbrella to work or not, um, is because they don't have it right. So this is coming and it deals with obviously with water. Um, and I just can't help but interject a question for you um, that you might think about. The cloud is made of water, right? Uh, no? Uh, well, H3O2, thank you. Okay, so, so that leads to... Yeah, yeah, well, I think it's partly H3O2, yeah. And um, if I take the water and I pour it, it goes down. So what keeps the cloud floating? Just something to think about during your coffee. Uh, I think the <laughs> easy is really important for health. The, the textbooks of biochemistry and cell biology treat water as the background carrier of the more important molecules of life. It's just sitting there, that's all, doing nothing. I think the opposite is true. Eating foods, it's really nice to know the role of water inside the foods. There are practical issues like using some of these concepts for filtration and desalination, which our company, Fourth Phase Incorporated, is working on. And also, you've got separation of charge. You should be able to get electricity from that, which especially Kurt sitting there has demonstrated. Um, I can't stop without mentioning the Institute for Venture Science, completely separate from what, I'm, what I've been talking about. But this institute is something that we're working on, and we're working on funding promising ideas that challenge conventional thinking and may bring scientific revolutions, which have been few and far between, plenty of technological revolutions. But it's really hard to identify important, fundamental, realized scientific revolutions that have changed the world despite huge amounts of funding. Um, and Beverly Rubick is sitting. She's involved with this uh, group as, as well. From 200 pre-proposals, we've 
we've identified five exciting projects and we've received some donations. We're looking for more donors, people who have done well, who would like to return to society to do something, something useful. And finally, um, the uh, uh, a book that describes much of what I've been talking about is this one, and um, it also <laughs> exists now in, in German. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Jerry. We have time for uh, two, three questions, I suppose, not more, but we have a lot, uh, a lot of time uh, till Sunday, so everybody uh, Jerry is open to all the questions, I suppose. So please, <coughs> who can? Thank you, Jerry, for this wonderful introduction and for the Thank wonderful you. overview. It's always nice to hear you. Um, uh, two brief questions. Number one, body temperature, 36.5. Why do you think it's, from your point of view, from your knowledge, relevant that we have 36.5 degrees? Could you, could you, sorry. Body temperature. Is, yeah. Why don't we have, why we have particularly 36.5 you know, physiologically normal working human being from your point of view? And the Be second one? Before you get, may I answer okay. the first one? Because yeah, otherwise ahead, I yeah, forget. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, temperature is essentially based on infrared radiation that's occurring. Most of our body uh, is easy water and a certain fraction of it is ordinary water. Easy water radiates much less uh, than does ordinary water. So the temperature effectively is a sum of the radiation of the easy water and uh, the uh, fraction that's not easy water. And together, um, the, these are, are, are maintained. If you have a, if you have a fever, um, you're ill your body temperature goes up. And one possible explanation for this is when you're ill, you have less easy water. Some of the easy water has converted to ordinary water. Ordinary water moves around, radiates more, therefore you have a higher temperature. Higher temperature, in turn, is useful because it builds more easy water and then restores your health. So it's a, it's a, a, loop. It's a loop that uh, can repair itself. I thought I heard you say that electrons increase easy water. True, and what's the evidence? The evidence is uh, we put, um, we can put two electrodes in water. Uh, we also put pH sensitive dye in the water. And we see the region uh, where we, the negative electrode, it actually builds easy slowly into a blob. And the one, uh, uh, and, and this blob, it doesn't have, it, it, it's different from the rest of the water, and it contains uh, negative charge. And, and we can actually take uh, the, this, this blob, this negatively charged blob, we check the negatively charged blob, it, it, it sticks together just as easy water, and it also has an absorption at 270 nanometers. We found the same with electrodes, this is very recent. You put electrodes in, in water, and you put pH sensitive die, and you expect that you have a positive electrode and negative electrode, and you put a potential difference, and you expect current to flow uniformly, it absolutely doesn't flow. What happens is the, uh, the region next to the negative electrode builds something that looks like easy water next to it. It grows slowly. It grows in little, little sections next to something equivalent on the positive side. So, so it's much, much different from, uh, from what, what you expect. Hi. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm a medical doctor from Canada. We spoke briefly uh, a few months ago. Um, and I was just wondering uh, if this, uh, this particular structure of water is part of a, a bigger set of possibilities of water structure that would include the sort of complex structures in uh, homeopathic remedies and uh, other ways of st storing information in water? Uh, yes, uh, I think that's entirely, entirely possible. Um, so some of, the, some of the most important work has in, 
in the field of homeopathy has been done by Professor Konovalov from, from Russia. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he showed, he showed that um, when, when you, and Vladimir knows this very well, when you dilute, uh, you take, a, take a, um, uh, some, some substance that's in water and you dilute it one to 10 and you shake it, and you dilute it one to 10 and you shake it and so on, going down the homeopathic route, what you find is that not what you expect. Things are, are different after the third or fourth dilution. Um, you begin to pick up so-called nano aggregates. And I suspect, though I, I'm not sure, that some of these nano aggregates are actually easy water. And that when you shake it, what you're doing is you're taking these aggregates and breaking up into a lot of little aggregates, which then can nucleate more structure. So by the time you, you dilute it uh, an infinite number of times, you have a very large number of these, of these aggregates which contain information. So the information is, is then preserved way down no matter how many times you've diluted it. And uh, yeah, so I think the answer to your question is, is a hearty yes.